15 miles northeast of Jeffersonville, Indiana, just off State Highway 62, near the city of Charlestown, is a wilderness area that is known locally as Tunnel Mill. But to me and thousands of more around the world, its real name is Greens Mill, since that is what Brother Branham called this tract of hilly land here in the Ohio River Valley. He spent a great deal of time in these woods, hunting, fishing, and exploring. As far back as the early 20s, he ran a trap line for beaver in this area in order to help support his family. Brother Branham spoke of many great events that occurred just a few miles down the road from here. Today, merely the name Green's Mill is enough to excite the imagination of the believers of this message. And for many years, people have searched this area for the hiding place where the prophet went when he wanted to be alone, his secret cave. But its location remained a mystery. My name is George Smith, and I would like to invite you to come with me today for the experience of a lifetime. We will cross the streams and follow the steep trails that have known the footsteps of the prophet. Our goal is a spot that has only recently been discovered, a small rocky niche in a limestone cliff that overlooks a deep ravine. Many features of this spot that I will show you fit the descriptions that Brother Branham related on tape regarding his special cave. We have another reason for believing that the spot we will visit today is indeed the prophet's cave. Sister Branham, the only person besides the prophet to see the cave, once described to her daughter Rebecca what she saw there. I never did ask Mother to give me directions to the cave. I really don't believe she would have had I asked her. I asked her how much she could remember about her trip there, which was back in 1941. She wasn't much of an outdoors person. As far as I know, she only went the one time. But she told me that she remembered the cave very small, dark, cold. There was a, a space where Dad could lie down. There was a table. And most impressive to her, there was a large pyramid-shaped rock that hung down over the table. On July 23, 1965, Brother Branham and I drove down this road together. It appeared then much as it does today, with the heavy foliage on the trees and the water fairly deep in the creeks and streams. Every turn in the road brought back memories for him. The area is crisscrossed by creeks and streams with names like Nine Penny Branch and Yankee Creek, all of which empty into the main tributary called 14 Mile Creek. The convoluted path of 14 Mile Creek cuts across the land from north to south until finally the cold, clear water enters the muddy Ohio River just a few miles downstream from Green's Mill at a spot that by boat is exactly 14 miles from Jeffersonville, hence the name 14 Mile Creek. Here at the bottom of the hill where Nine Penny Branch joins with the larger 14 Mile Creek, Brother Branham stopped the car for a few moments. Even then, the land was posted as it is today, but he pointed downstream towards Beaver Hole a place known as being the best swimming spot in the county. He told me that as a young boy, he and his brothers would hitch a ride to Charlestown so that they could come here and play Tarzan on the rope swing and swim during the long, hot summer days. Today, we'll drive on a bit further following 14 Mile Creek upstream for a ways. It is early morning and a light haze still lingers in the woods. Within an hour or so, there will be quite a bit of traffic on this narrow country road, but we have found a good spot to park in a field that is not posted land. Although we are still quite a ways from the cave at this point, there is a spot just through the trees here where 14 Mile Creek is easy to cross. Just off to our right, at the far end of this field, in a tangle of vines and tall weeds, there is a rusted relic of what was once the most renowned attraction in all of southern Indiana. It is a large water wheel, and the story of how it came to be here is a remarkable one, one that we think is worth retelling. It answers a question many have asked, and that is, why did Brother Random call this area Green's Mill? The colorful history of this region dates from the early 1800s, 
when what is now Clark County was still a part of the huge Northwest Territories. In 1804, a man by the name of John Work, who was a miller by trade, moved to the Charlestown area from Kentucky. He purchased 100 acres of land along 14 Mile Creek and began the construction of a large stone dam and a mill. It was one of the first mills in southern Indiana, and soon he was grinding corn, wheat, and barley for the settlers and Indians alike who lived in the vicinity. Work was successful with his first mill, which was recognized as the best in the county, and Charlestown soon became the milling capital of the territory. Work was considered to be a somewhat of a genius in his day, and his natural ability in the field of engineering was great. So when after 15 or so years of constant use, the old stone mill needed repairing, he decided to build a new one. It was a mill that became a monument to pioneer ingenuity. Nature provided the setting for work scheme. On this plat map dating from the late 1800s, we can pinpoint the location of John Work's old mill and dam. Just downstream, 14 Mile Creek makes a long pear-shaped curve around the base of a hill, creating a peninsula of land between its banks. The distance through the narrowest point is a little over 300 feet, 300 feet of solid rock. John Work's plan was daring. He would blast a tunnel through the mountain at its narrow spot and divert the water to his new mill on the south side of the peninsula. The difference in the level of the creek between the two ends of the tunnel would provide a hefty 24-foot fall for water that would turn the mill wheel. It took three years for the tunnel to be completed. Over 650 pounds of powder was used to cut a water race six feet deep and five feet wide through the mountain, 94 feet below the summit. The new mill on the south end of the tunnel was completed in 1829 and immediately became famous throughout the entire state. Settlers brought their grain from as far away as Indianapolis to be ground at the amazing Tunnel Mill. John Work died in 1832, and his son took possession and continued in the business until 1854, when Mr. Wilford Green purchased the property. Although it was still officially called Tunnel Mill, local people began to refer to it as Green's Mill in consideration of the new owner. Today, the rusted wheel is the only evidence left of the legendary mill. The incredible tunnel that provided the never failing water supply was dynamited closed when it became snake infested and presented a danger to the Boy Scout camp nearby. The mill itself was destroyed by fire in 1927 to this day, Green's Mill has remained an unknown, out-of-the-way place whose true significance the world will never appreciate. In 1987, a brother from Virginia was hiking in the woods here at Green's Mill when he felt led to veer from the trail he had been following and to take instead a more difficult route along the side of a ridge. He had walked for some distance when he stopped to catch his breath and looked down. There at his feet was an opening into the side of the mountain. After exploring the interior of the small cave, the brother believed that this was indeed the cave of the prophet, but he felt very hesitant to share his newfound secret. He didn't know if its location should ever become common knowledge. So he chose to remain silent until the Lord showed him what to do. And he kept his secret for nearly three years, until in January of 1990, when he felt led to write to Rebecca and describe to her what he had found. The area around the cave is covered with very dense growth, and standing here at the entrance, it is easy to understand how the location of this cave remained completely hidden for so many years. Brother Branham once made the statement 
that he often would pull a large bush into the opening behind him, totally obscuring the entrance from even the closest scrutiny. It is not difficult to visualize just how that could be done. It is also easy to see that it is a place that was made for the prophet, a small man who was by nature rugged, brave, determined, and fully dedicated. Brother Branham did not come to his cave seeking a comfortable place where he could pray, for there is nothing comfortable or elegant to be found here. Instead, it is a rocky shelter for a true man of the wilderness. Isolated from the rest of the world, here he communicated with the Almighty. Okay, I'm right inside the cave here, about two feet. As you can appreciate the view of the entrance here, it's very narrow, very sharp rocks, uh, no greater width than about 15 inches, the widest part. And the ground slopes off very quickly after entering. Uh, right at the very entrance, it's only about two and a half feet high and then it slopes off fast so that it goes down to about six foot height right away. It's very hard to get any footing right here on this slick mud. It's very wet and damp inside here. Even here at the entrance, you can see that it is cold enough to see your breath. We're going farther back in to where we can actually stand up at this point here. Okay, right here it's six foot high. It's about the maximum height. We are far enough inside at this point that we can stand. In front of us, the very narrow passageway, about 25 feet in length, leads to a small chamber at the rear of the cave. The ceiling is composed of a multitude of limestone rocks, tightly wedged into place, but having the appearance of being ready to fall. The slightly damp walls are about 20 inches apart right here. This is probably the widest part of the passageway. At this point, I cannot turn the camera, but only a few inches to the right or left. The shots are bumpy, but that will help to emphasize what extremely tight quarters we are in. It's hard to believe the difference in the temperature. Outside, it is 80 degrees. In here, it is more like 40 degrees. It would appear to be an ideal hideaway for wildlife, but we found no signs that animals had ever occupied the cave. The only items found in the cave were on the shelf here to the left, a 1964 penny and traces of candle wax. In the three years that have passed since the cave was first found, several large rocks have fallen from the ceiling. One such rock is blocking the passageway here in front of us. On the other side of this rock, the floor drops completely, and there are only two or three places where a person can stand. Now further into the passageway, we look into the rear chamber. The walls are only about 10 inches apart, and there's only one more rock to stand on. From here, you can see the table and the pyramid rock which hangs down over it. And now I will try to reach the camera into the chamber for a better view. Of the nature form pieces of furniture that Brother Branham refers to, only the table is still intact. It is formed from a massive slab of limestone, and its corners are perfectly square. It measures three feet by four feet across the top and about three feet high. Directly over the center of the table hangs the sharp-edged, pyramid-shaped stone that Sister Branham described to Rebecca. It's easy to understand why this site stayed so vividly in her memory. The point of the stone is poised just inches above the surface of the table, as though its downward plunge was halted just a fraction of a second before it would have been destroyed. 
It is breathtaking. It is our belief that the cave is slowly but surely collapsing inward. As you can see here, the floor beneath the table has fallen away. The area to our right is just a jumble of huge blocks of limestone. In any case, it is no longer safe for us to try and explore further, and maybe it would not even be appropriate for us to do so. I've turned around now to face back towards the exit. Straight ahead, you can see just a crack of light from outside. With the light on, you can see again how close the walls are and the curve the passageway makes as it angles back into the mountain, towards the table and the pyramid stone, which are now behind us. From here, there's also a better view of the large rock that has fallen within the past three years and which blocks our way. You can also see how the floor changes at this point, becoming a jumble of sharp stones on back to the chamber. Before we move around this curve in the passageway, bringing the exit into full view, I would like to say that I feel very privileged to have had an opportunity to visit this special place. I stand here, and in my mind, I can see Brother Branham pressing his way between these walls, maybe after being back in the chamber praying for many days. I can imagine just how he would climb up through the opening and stand on the big rock that is close by. This is something I will always treasure. Once again, we are back at the widest part of the passageway. Worth noting are the flat stones in the ceiling here. At no other place in the cave did we find a stone even similar to the pyramid-shaped one that hangs over the table. You can see how mud and leaves have washed into the entrance, and the slippery incline offers no firm footing as we try to make our way back up to the very small, rocky opening. Because of the potential danger to the public that is presented by the unsafe trail and the crumbling interior of the cave, the entrance is now being covered over and directions to its exact location will not be given. We believe that in our efforts to document the life and ministry of Brother William Branham, the Lord permitted us this glimpse of the hidden private cavern, and after prayerful consideration, we feel that the location of the cave should remain a secret. After the last video footage was taken, we carefully covered the entrance, not planning to enter it again.